Hey there, Leesburg Grace Church. By the way, that is a powerful term right there, church. One of the two times that Jesus uses it, he talks about how the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So I'm standing here with this gate, and it's this visual reminder that there is nothing that can stop God's church, Jesus' church, from doing his work in the world. Not persecution, not heresy, not division. Actually, that's something we're going to be talking about today, is how the church is called to be a united new kind of person. So stay tuned to the sermon at the end as we go through Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. Before we get there, here are a few other things. We have some announcements that are going to tell you about what's coming up at our church. This includes, in October, the relaunch of our small group ministries with some tweaks due to COVID. And then also, we have something we're starting once a month called Deep Dive. What does it mean to follow Master Jesus in His ways? It's going to be interactive. It's going to provide opportunities for personal reflection. It's going to help us be the kind of people we are intended to be as the church. We also have a song for you, a scripture reading to help you reflect on the peace that Jesus offers us, and of course we'll get to the message. Hey, whether you're meeting online or you meet with us live sometimes, we want to make sure that you stay connected to us. And so reach out through email, tim.sprankle at gmail.com, or find more information on our Facebook or webpage. All right, great to be with you this morning.
one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Given our political climate right now, those last few phrases of the Pledge of Allegiance almost sound humorous. One nation, indivisible, this is not the America I'm living in. Not if you watch the news, not if you tune into social media, not if you're paying attention to the ranting, to the raving of people on either side of the divide. We have a very divided nation right now, and it is a sobering time to be an American. I feel like uh, the racial divide is the thing that's really caught people's attention most recently. And the reason we're talking about this is because the, t the passage we're looking at in Ephesians gets at the heart of racial division in the church. So we're not going to pull punches today. We're going to talk about this, this real sensitive, real relevant issue. I'm going to take down the flag. It's not an act of disrespect. It's so you can see what's on this fence. Jacob Blake was shot in Kenosha, Wisconsin a little over a week ago. And right after that happened, the NBA made a decision that they were going to cancel a game and perhaps the rest of the season. I don't want to get into the politics of basketball. What I do want to do is look at the quote from Doc Rivers, who came on to an interview after the game. And this is what he said. He said, I'm amazed that we, and when he says we, he's talking about black Americans. I'm amazed that we keep loving this country and this country doesn't love us back. It's really just so sad. I should just be a coach, but instead I'm being reminded of my color. We've got to do better than this, he says. You don't need to be black to be outraged. You need to be an American to be outraged. That's what Doc Rivers says. Now, I'm not asking you to agree or disagree with Doc Rivers right now. What I'm asking you to do is consider what life from Doc Rivers, a black American, is like. And don't think, well, he's different than the average black American because he makes millions of dollars. He is a black American and he is watching our nation get torn up along racial lines. And he's saying, we've got to do better than this. I'm outraged as an American. It's really a profound statement. We have this stretch of road that, that we take on the way home to my house. Almost every day when I leave the church building and come home, I go down this street. There are a series of Trump flags, followed by a series of flags representing different ideological systems. There's a couple uh, rainbow flags for the LGBTQ community. There's one Rastafarian flag. And then there's a house with a window that says Black Lives Matter and a couple other placards there. My daughters, when we drive down this street, say it's Division Lane. On two sides of the street, or sometimes one house to the next, there's this real glaring picture of divide. And that's a microcosm of our country right now. And this is why we read history. So we don't get alarmed. So we don't actually just jump on the outrage train. But we come back to how have we dealt with this in the past? And how can we continue to do better? As the church. As followers of Jesus. As called out, spirit and dwelled, holy people. I'm talking to the church. And I'm asking, what is our response to this? Because this is not a new problem. This is something that goes back to the onset of the church. When Jews and Gentiles had to figure out, how do we get along? How do we tear down some of these fences that we see all through our neighborhoods? And a fence does two things. It keeps people in the boundaries that you want to set for them. And it keeps people out that you don't want coming into your community. A fence keeps people out and it keeps people in. It sets a boundary. And Jesus did a work in Ephesians chapter 2 
that broke down the dividing wall, that broke down a ideological boundary between Jews and Gentiles. We are in a series in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians opens up with this beautiful doxology, this beautiful blessing. We applaud God because he's trying to bring the world, to win the world back to himself, and he did that through the death of Jesus. And it's not just for one ethnic people, it's for all peoples, but they gotta receive it. And when they receive it, we pray that they have clarity. That's the second part of this message. God, give us clarity. And the Apostle Paul prays for his people. He prays for them, maybe not having a deep personal relationship with all of these different house churches around Asia Minor. That's, that's who this letter is directed to. But he has a deep sense that they are in a world where they don't see everything that's going on. That the political divide, some people are, are worshiping the emperor. That the spiritual divide, some people are wor worshiping local deities like Artemis. That that clouds their vision, not just of God, but it actually affects their relationships with others. And the Apostle Paul realizes that God needs to intervene if we're going to live the right kind of way. And so then he shares with them, and we looked at this last week, about how God gives life, not just life up from the grave, but full life. And so we looked at this passage where we were dead and we didn't know it, but we're alive and we didn't deserve it. And now that God has given us new life as followers of Jesus, our lives matter. What we do can make a difference in the world. And so that's where we've gone so far. There's this amazing gift of salvation, this rescue that we didn't deserve. And now God has made us and called us to be his workmanship, to do good works that he's laid out in advance. And then he transitions. And now he's going to the next part of the passage that is intimately connected. This vertical relationship with God as it's healed should result in horizontal relationships being healed of us tearing down the fences, the walls that divide us between our neighbors so that we can love them well, so that we can practice justice, so we can share the good news and peace that Jesus offers in spite of people's gender identification, in spite of people's racial or ethnic heritage, in spite of people's socioeconomic conditions, we gotta break down those walls and share the good news of the peace that Jesus offers to all peoples. So that's where we're headed right now in Ephesians. And I wanna read the passage to you. Ephesians chapter two, verses 11 through 22. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down his, in his flesh this dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in a place of the two. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God and one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who were near for through him, we both have access in one spirit to the father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Let me pray before we proceed and look at three insights that come from this passage and then the big idea about us being peacemakers, not gatekeepers. God has called us to be peacemakers, not gatekeepers. Let me pray right now that God, we would be receptive, that God, we would not be defensive, that God, as we talk about things that are real, heavy, 
and intense in our culture, that we would be willing to listen as humble, loving, Christ-like Jesus followers. And that for a moment, we'd be able to set aside our bias, our prejudice, our ideology, and listen to your word being spoken to our hearts that you would give us, God, clarity on how we treat one another. We pray this in Jesus' name, who treated all people with dignity and loved them well and died on their behalf. Amen. Well, let's look at three insights from this passage. We're going to break it down. The first couple of verses, what they're going to do is they're going to talk about how isolation is a hopeless way to live. And what the Apostle Paul has done is he is like in verses 1 through 10 saying, you once lived this way, you were dead and didn't know it, but now you're alive, you're raised, you're seated with Christ. He's telling the Gentiles, you once as a Gentile had this hopeless way of living, but now you are a new people with the Jews as the church with the Holy Spirit alive in you. So this once now affects our vertical relationship with God, but also it should affect our horizontal relationship with other peoples. He's using that same kind of language. The other thing he's doing in this passage as we go through it is he identifies seven former things. In fact, the opening verb here is, I want you to remember. And he starts off with a couple that you were Gentiles, you were uncircumcised, and he almost gets kind of caught up in this idea of circumcision. It's like he needs to explain it to them because they are non-Jewish people living far away from the temple. And so this idea of Jewish customs, although they would have been familiar with the Jewish religion because Jews lived in Asia Minor, they lived in Ephesus, it wasn't the predominant religion there. So there would have been Jewish Christians, there would have been Gentile Christians, but they probably needed a bit of a primer on this idea of the Jewish people and their practice of circumcision. And then he goes through five other things. They were separated, alienated, strangers, they were hopeless, they were without God. So if you're reading through the text, you need to remember these, these seven things. You were people who were not privileged. You were people who were on the outside. Remember this. Remember this because as you start following Jesus, you don't want to set up walls. You remember what it was like before you were invited into this new people of God? You were outsiders. You were strangers. You were aliens. That doesn't feel good. Being hopeless is an isolated, or being isolated is a hopeless way to live. So you were Gentiles. Gentiles includes everyone who's non-Jewish to the Jewish people. Gentiles in the flesh. Remember, we talked about flesh last week. Flesh has two meanings. It can literally just mean your flesh this part of your body, the skin, the material, or flesh can actually talk about that spiritual part of you. Last week, that's what we said. The spiritual part of you that's opposed to God, that's resistant to God. It says you were called the uncircumcision by what was called the circumcision. So the Jewish people were going around saying, you guys are outsiders. You're not circumcised. We're circumcised. This is actually a topic that Paul brings up in a couple different letters. Colossians 2, which has lots of overlap with Ephesians, talks about the circumcision. Galatians talks about the circumcision. Titus talks about the circumcision. And Jewish Christians use that as a bragging right. If you really want to be a God-honoring follower of Jesus, you should get circumcised. And the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9 was called to Gentiles. And he didn't want to create extra steps or barriers for them to come to know Jesus. And so he makes it very clear, and God endorses this message. You don't have to get circumcised. That's the cutting off of the foreskin. You don't have to get circumcised to become a follower of Jesus. That extra step doesn't add anything. In fact, Paul says, if anything, that extra step draws you farther away from Christ. It's not a bragging right. He, in fact, does this thing. He says, that it was made by the hands. And in Ephesus, you can read this in Acts 19 and 20, there were people who made idols out of their hands. These were handcrafted gods that people in Ephesus would worship. They would bow down to something that's handmade. <laughs> and Paul thinks that's hilarious because how, why are you going to worship something handmade? If you go all the way back to the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, Isaiah says the same thing. Chapters 42, 43, 44, he keeps bringing up idolatry. You're worshiping something that's handmade. And sometimes our religion is handmade. 
And handmade religion doesn't please God. Handmade religion doesn't give us favor with God. And so what the Apostle Paul is doing here is he's saying handmade idols and handmade religious rites are in the same category. So remember this. You were a Gentile. You were practicing handmade religion. He says you were separated from Christ. Now here he's speaking generically of Messiah. The Jewish people had a promise of a king who was going to come in the line of David, who was going to fulfill God's promises and bring power and prestige back to the Jewish people. That promise applied to the Jewish people. And here he's saying you were separated from those promises. You can read about it in 2 Samuel chapter 7, in Psalm chapter 2, in Psalm 110. There's this idea of Messiah who will come, Jeremiah 24. But that doesn't apply to you. Now later it's going to say Christ Jesus, and that's going to become more personal to them. You are alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You weren't part of that ethnic religious people. You didn't have their ethnic religious rights. You were strangers to the covenants of promise, he says. And it's covenants plural. So the Jewish people experienced several covenants. There was the covenant to Noah, that God wouldn't destroy the earth again. There was the covenant to Moses, that if they obeyed the commands, God would bring blessing to them. That was not a covenant of promise. That was a covenant of law. Then there was the covenant to David, I will set on my on on your on my throne a son for the rest of the generations so there was this promise to david that you will always have a son on the throne and then there was a new covenant new covenant was i will put my law in your heart i will forgive your people of their sins you will be my people these covenants of promise actually all build on the promise he made first of all to abraham in genesis chapter 12. And that was a covenant where he says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a name. I'm going to give you land. And I'm going to bless all peoples, all nations through you. So those covenants came to the Jewish people through Abraham and David. But if God's people lived the way God wanted the Jewish people to live, they would have been a blessing to the nations. But the Gentiles, they didn't didn't get that. They were outside of those. They were strangers to that covenant. And then he says, here's another thing about your hopeless life. You had no hope. No hope in resurrection. No hope in the afterlife. No hope in a God coming to your rescue. In fact, you were without God. That's where we get the word atheist. You were a godless. Now, they had plenty of gods, local deities. The temple of Artemis in the town of Ephesus, one of the seven great wonders of the world. But they were really without a God that was theirs. They were atheists it says. This is living in isolation. But now in Christ Jesus, you who have been far off have been brought near. This idea of being far off is using spatial terms, but it's talking about relational intimacy with God. This is just like Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 where he says, you were dead in your sins and trespasses, but God made you alive. You were far off, you were hopeless, you were isolated, but in Christ you are brought near. So there's good news for these Jewish people. The blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ is an offer to all peoples. So isolation is a hopeless way to live. And what the Apostle Paul is saying is you have to remember Jewish people or Gentile people, you have to remember, Gentile people, that before Jesus came into the world, you were hopeless because you were isolated from God. You were hopeless because you were isolated from God. But then Jesus came and brought you near to God. At least the offer was on the table to you. Isolation is a hopeless way to live. Now, we experience this in human relationships, too. I know that COVID-19 and this extended the quarantine, the stay-at-home orders, the isolation that people feel, especially those who are older, those who are single, those who have health situations, they feel terribly isolated. We did a study of people in our church, and not a ton of people logged on, but of those who replied to the study in our church, two people listed that they feel terribly isolated right now. It's a horrible way to live. You can't gather for on-site worship. You can't go out to the store and just walk around and socialize with people. You're not getting invited to extended family birthday parties. 
and that isolation is a hopeless way to live. We experience that socially. I have a friend who was telling me about a situation in his church. Uh, there's a woman who is experiencing uh, a real hopeless situation right now. In her marriage, there's been abuse and her husband has isolated her from lots of other people until recently she started coming to church. And she and her kids were coming to church because it brought them out of isolation. They were cut off from extended family. They were cut off from friends. They were cut off from neighbors. And she was feeling hopeless in this experience of, of abuse and neglect. And because she came to church, she finally started building relationships where she could let some people know about how she was feeling trapped and hopeless. And right now the, the church and some of the people are trying to figure out how do we help this woman in this really toxic relationship. But if you are utterly alone in that kind of situation where there's abuse, where there's neglect, that can feel hopeless. And people feel that way. The church is supposed to be a place where you can come with your burdens and share them and people will lift you up in prayer and people will provide uh, uh, refuge for you and people will provide resources for you and isolation is a hopeless way to live. And if you have no God that you can cry out to and no one can point you to that God, it can be a very hopeless way to live. And the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, remember, you were isolated before and this is a hopeless way to live. Never forget that. So as you see people who are hopeless, who are isolated, reach out to them and let them know about the kind of relationship with God that you can have through Jesus. And that kind of relationship is a healed relationship. The word that the Apostle Paul uses here is it's a reconciled relationship. Where once it was broken, now it's mended. Where once it was far off, now it's close and knit. The next set of verses say that reconciliation is a healing work of Christ. Reconciliation is a healing work of Christ. There are many words that the Apostle Paul uses to describe the work of Jesus on our behalf, the atonement or salvation. And so one of those words is justification. One of those words is atonement. One of those words that we saw in chapter one was enlightenment. All of a sudden you have clarity and eyes to see. Now in this passage, it's reconciliation. The idea of Jesus triumphing over the powers and Satan and sin and death is this idea of Christus victor. We can experience triumph in Jesus. And there are many words that the Apostle Paul uses to describe salvation, but the one he keys on it here is reconciliation. Once a relationship with God that was isolation, where there was enmity, where there was hostility, now is a healed, mended, loving, restored relationship. That's what we have with God, and but he envisions us having that with other people too. So just like in the first couple of verses, we saw seven formers. Now we get to see seven acts of Jesus. Jesus here is the main subject. He's the one who's acting in these different verbs. We see that Jesus made two people, both people, Jews and Gentiles, into one. Jesus broke down a wall of hostility. Jesus abolished the law that Jewish people were hanging over the heads of other people using to create a fence. And he abolished that so that he could create one new person. Jesus made peace. Jesus reconciled us to God. Jesus killed hostility between us and God and hopefully between us and our neighbors, us and our brothers and sisters, us and our fellow humans. It starts with this, a recognition that Jesus is our peace. Four times in this passage, the word peace is used. And peace doesn't just mean the end of hostility. It's also a word for all things becoming well. All things being ordered right. Eight times in the book of Ephesians, the word peace is used. It's opening greeting, it's closing greeting. But now here, peace is personal. Peace is is the person of Jesus. He's the promised Prince of Peace. And he's going to work out peace in our relationships with God and with others. And he calls us to be peacemakers. He does that symbolically by breaking down the dividing wall of hostility. Now there's two ways to understand this dividing wall. We can understand it literally as the wall that was in the temple in Jerusalem in Jerusalem, the temple area had many walls. 
And one of the walls was a wall that divided Gentiles from Jews. And then there was this dividing section between men and women. And then eventually only the priests could go into the temple area. And that would have been something that some people in Ephesus would have known about, but many of the Jewish or I mean, many of the Gentile Christians would not have been to Jerusalem or really had a frame of reference for this. And so this idea of the wall of hostility could conjure up the Jew-Gentile wall in the Jerusalem temple context. But more likely, it is a metaphorical wall like this fence that was the law. We're told that uh, the Pharisees, who were law-abiding, upstanding Jewish people, they used the law to create fences between God's people and the rest of the world. So it was a metaphorical law. And Jesus fulfilled the law, so we don't have to fulfill all of its requirements. And the Apostle Paul says that the law was just a tutor to point us to our need for Jesus. The law is good, it points us in a direction, but the law can't make us right before God. And the Apostle Paul talks about this in his letters like Galatians and Romans. And so Jesus has abolished that law of the commandments that's expressed in the ordinances. He's, his, his job is to create one new person. This creation language was already used in chapter 2, verse 10, where his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And it's not like there's Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. The Apostle Paul makes it very clear, I'm creating one new person. There aren't black Americans and white Americans. There aren't rich Americans and poor Americans. There aren't democratic Americans and Republican Americans. We're one nation, right? At least that's what we say. What Paul's envisioning here is one people of God in those ethnic, socioeconomic, gender distinctions don't matter anymore. There should be peace that defines us as the one people of God. Because we are reconciled to God, we should be reconciled to one another. And what did it take to reconcile us to, to God and one another? The cross of Jesus. That perfect symbol of vertical and horizontal relationship that was repaired. That killed the hostility. And so Jesus did what he envisioned or understood from the book of Isaiah. He was the suffering servant. He was the promised Messiah. And he preached good news to all peoples. Isaiah 57, verse 19, 17 through 19, talk about the servant is going to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. In the context in Isaiah, and Paul's quoting that verse right here or alluding to it, in Isaiah, it's talking about the Jewish people who are scattered among the nations. Paul reframes it. Paul reuses it, saying those who were far off were the Gentiles. Those who were near, symbolically, were the Jewish people. Both get the message. There is peace offered by Jesus. And that peace makes us one new person. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. And this is one more time where the Apostle Paul makes reference to the Trinity. Father, Son, Spirit working together to make us into God's people. So reconciliation is a healing work of Christ. Right relationship with God and right relationship with others. This is a summons, this is a plea right now to believers who are getting caught up in the political, racial outrage of our day. You are called to a ministry of healing. You are called to a ministry of reconciliation. You are called to be peacemakers. You are ambassadors of Christ not ambassadors of America, not ambassadors of Black Lives Matter, not ambassadors of the Patriot Movement. You are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. You are called, first and foremost, to create a pathway of reconciliation between God and others, and then try to work peace among your fellow man. Reconciliation is a healing work of Christ. And there's some really great examples of Christians trying to practice this. 
If you go on YouTube and type in Douglas Wilson and Christopher Hitchens, here's an evangelical Christian debating with a new atheist. And several of their debates touring across the country are captured online. Christopher Hitchens uh, died several years ago, and Douglas Wilson had some very kind things to say about him and the, the friendship that they developed. Now, it doesn't mean that Christopher Hitchens became a follower of Jesus, but that kind of healing relationship requires a Christian to say, I'm going to be a peacemaker. I'm going to reach across the lines. Similar thing happened with Barry Corey and a key leader from the LGBTQ community out in California and also a political figure in California. In two instances, he reached across lines. Barry Corey is the president of Biola University. He wrote the book Love Kindness, and he wanted to develop a relationship and have kind, thoughtful conversations with people who disagreed with him about gender and sexuality. Again, he may not have won them over to his side, but he was very winsome. And to reach out and to have these kind of conversations Ha requires you to recognize this is a healing work of Christ. I want to try to be a ambassador of Christ, a minister of reconciliation. Paul uses those terms in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You see similar things when police officers are kneeling at peaceful protests hosted by Black Lives Matter people. It takes a tremendous amount of courage, a tremendous amount of conviction, and a deep sense of Jesus's offer of peace to practice reconciliation. Of course, this isn't just along political, ideological lines. To reach out to someone who has hurt you in a friendship and say, hey, I want to rebuild this friendship. To give someone a second chance who betrayed you takes a tremendous amount of courage. Reconciliation is a healing work of Christ. It takes time, it takes courage, but it's something that Jesus offers to us. This relationship was made right so that we can create, provide peace in this direction. The last part of this passage says that communion is a holy witness to the world. And now these Jewish Christians and these Gentile Christians are just one new people. There are just Christians. There is just the church. And the Apostle Paul wants to make that loud and clear. He uses a couple different metaphors to talk about the church. He says to the, the readers, you're no longer strangers, you're no longer aliens, you're fellow citizens with the saints. All of us are one new people. You're members of the household. And that's the first metaphor used here. This is a new family. We have been adopted into the family of God. There are so no second-rate children in the family of God. He says that this has been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. A couple times he mentions the apostles and prophets in the book of Ephesians. These are also gifts or roles that he's given to the church. There is the uppercase apostle, the, those 12 that walked with Jesus, and then Paul, who was included in that, who had a deep understanding and a personal relationship with Jesus before or after his resurrection. They could do miracles. And then there's lowercase apostles who lay the foundation of new churches. Prophets, similarly, not Old Testament prophets, but prophets who spoke the word of God with clarity. Sometimes they're foretelling the future, but most of the time they're doing foretelling. They're speaking for God, and they work together to interpret that message and make sure it clearly came from the Spirit. So they lay the foundation from the church, but it's everybody in the church working together for the church to grow. And of course, Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. So in other letters and in here, he's saying, we all got to work together. Don't brag about your gifts. Jesus is the centerpiece. He's using this language like he used earlier, where he says we were raised with, we were seated with. Now he's saying we were joined together with Christ. We are built together as the church. This togetherness language, these verbs with the, word, with the preposition soon or with, show up often in Ephesians. And it's something that Paul uses to say we're united with Christ, we're united with one another. Communion is a holy witness to the world. 
And then he says, we're growing into a temple. Now, this temple language to the Jewish people takes them to Jerusalem. This temple language to the Gentile people maybe takes them to the temple of Artemis. What really matters here is it's where the Spirit of God dwells. There is power when God's people are together. There is God's presence when God comes together. There is growth that happens when God's people are together. So we need to find ways to be together. The gathered people of God have a power in their witness. So N.T. Wright says, without God's spirit, there's nothing that we can do that will count for God's kingdom. Without God's spirit, the church simply cannot be the church. Again, Trinitarian language, Father, Son, Spirit here. But we are the dwelling place of the spirit. And what the Apostle Paul is doing here is he's giving us God's perspective of the church. Don't listen to what the world says. Don't listen to the accusations of the devil. They call us hypocrites. They call us liars. They call us losers. They call us outdated, outmoded. They call us racist. They call us bigots. That's not God's perspective of the church. The church is the holy, called out people of God, sons and daughters who have a mission to the world, a mission of reconciliation, a mission of justice, a mission of truth telling. We don't create the church, Peterson says. We enter and participate to what God has given us. There's more, far more to the church than us. There is Son, Father, Holy Spirit. We miss the complexity. We miss the glory of the church if we insist on measuring and defining it by the parts that we play. Father, Son, and Spirit must be center to the church. The Spirit of God dwelling in us must be center to the church. When we gather, when we commune, it is a holy witness to the world. And we can witness to the world with our online gatherings. We can witness to the world with our on-site gatherings. We can witness to the world when we serve together in the world, but communion is a holy witness to the world. And the way that we as the church try to handle racial divide right now or political divide right now, the way that we, the church, try to pray for our nation during COVID, as people try to do education in a completely different form, as we continue to shop in our local communities and love our local service people, that can be a witness in the world. This is not a time for the church to recede. This is a time for the church to rise up, to commune, to be holy, to reach out, to show love, to break down walls. Eric Mason says, we should feel more at home with people in the Christian family than our own ethnicity. In other words, the best part of our family should be those who have the same eternal blood type, not just the same physical blood type. And this is a really good time for white evangelical churches to listen to black authors like Eric Mason and learn what it feels like to be a black church in America these days. I want to commune with those brothers and hear what they have to say, even if it's hard to hear. One author, Jamal Tisby, wrote a book called The Color of Compromise. Subtitled, The Complicity of the White Evangelical Church Evangelical Church in Racism in America. Wait, I'm a racist? Wait, I'm complicit? Wait, I'm part of white supremacy? Then what happens to people like me is we immediately feel defensive when we hear things like that. And when you feel defensive, you put up walls and you <laughs> create greater division. And this is my black brother speaking into my life as a white brother. And I need to listen. And when I learn to listen and love and change and repent and lament, I'm practicing communion. And that's a holy witness to the world. When I build more fences, when I keep my gate, I miss an opportunity to show Christ's love and to practice Christ's peace. This is the overall call in this passage, 
to these Gentile believers who are on the other side of the fence but now have been included. Don't consider yourself superior now. Don't make your exceptionalism, your greatness, a reason to put up walls and keep other people away. Christ calls us, all of us, to peacemaking, not gatekeeping. Christ calls us to peacemaking, not gatekeeping. And gates come for various reasons. Let's be honest. Why do we put up these gates? Why do we erect fences? Why do we build walls? Well, because it's safe behind them. It keeps people out. It creates security. Enemies can't get in. Ideologies can't get in. There's jealousy. That's why. I want my stuff. I want my rights. I want my privileges. I want my home without my neighbors looking in. I'm jealous for my own stuff. I want control. I want to determine who comes into my property and who stays out of my property. Who can see what's going on in my backyard and who can't. I want to determine who comes into our parking lot and keeps their car there and who stays away. Why else do we use gates? Well, we get to determine who's included and who's excluded. Let's talk about the kind of gates that we have in our lives. It's not just a literal physical structure. In fact, a clique that you might have in your church. You only hang out with people in your life stage. You only hang out with people who play with kids like your kids. You only hang out with people in your socioeconomic condition. You only fraternize with people who have your political belief system. Cliques and clubs. Racial prejudice, that could be one. You have no friends who are unlike you with their <laughs> ethnicity. And maybe you live in a place where there's not a lot of diversity. And it's not necessarily easy to develop those kind of relationships. But racial prejudice is a gate. And you can still decide to root for people from a different color or race, read books and watch movies about different people and different races, vote for people from different ethnic backgrounds, socioeconomic status, gender distinction, you avoid women at all costs. You're awkward around them. We create gates with religious terms and conditions. Mainline, evangelical, reformed, dispensational, Bible-believing. It goes on and on. These are the kind of gates that we keep. Which kind of gate do you keep? Be honest about it. John Perkins, a civil rights activist and author, writes in his book, Blood, we have been intentional about building the walls that separate us as blacks and whites. We must be even more intentional about tearing them down. So what are the marks of a peacemaker? Because Christ calls us to peacemaking, not gatekeeping. What are the marks of a peacemaker? Humility and empathy. When you are challenged about the kind of gates that maybe you have up, if your first response is defensiveness, you want to shout back, you want to argue, that might be driven by pride. We're called to be humble. Empathy. What's it like on the other side of the fence? Do you know people on the other side of the fence? Do you remember what it was like when you were on the other side of the fence? Willingness to listen. You might listen in an interpersonal conversation. You might listen to a coworker who's different than you. You might listen by reading someone's memoirs, listening to someone's podcast in an interview, but willingness to listen to the other side. A peacemaker has a strong sense of justice. They don't just want to end the hostility, but they want to make things right. And this is very complicated if what's wrong is deeply systematic. If it's interpersonal, it's also complicated because there are wounds and there are scars and there's history. And so this strong sense of justice must be tempered with a sense of patience too but always working to make things better. Remember what Doc Rivers said, we got to do better. 
And if it's not driven by a love, it's not going to get very far. So loving other people and loving other peoples. Of course, it's going to take courage and it's going to take sacrifice. From what I've read, speaking about racism in a sermon or racial injustice and divide is one of the most polarizing topics. I can think of four topics as a pastor you don't want to bring up, whether online or on site. Number one, you really don't want to bring up politics unless it's like two weeks before the election and then tell everyone to vote. Remind them that Jesus is king and it doesn't matter who's in. Uh, remind them that Jesus is king. Two, you don't want to bring up physical health, weight, and exercise. People take deep offense to that and they say, you need to talk about spiritual things. Well, actually, care for your physical body can be a deeply spiritual thing. Third, money. People don't want to talk about money. Uh, that's my money. That's my stuff. You're just trying to raise the offering. And fourth, racism. Because no one wants to deal with that perhaps being part of their heart's darkness. But we have to talk about it. And a text like Ephesians 2.11 that calls us to peacemaking, not gatekeeping, is a great place to go. It takes courage. It takes courage for you to talk about it with your extended family. It takes courage for you to stand up for it in the classroom. It takes courage for you to, to go to a peaceful protest. It takes courage. It takes sacrifice. And remember, Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice because he wanted peace between us and God, and he wanted us to develop peacemaking relationships in the world. He died for our sins on a cross bearing our shame. A peacemaker will accept the sacrifice of Jesus and find ways to replicate the sacrifice of Jesus. So this week, God help me be humble, pray it. God give me an opportunity to empathize, pray it. God help me listen, pray it. God, give me your sense of justice, a strong sense of justice and the patience to go along with it. God, give me a deeper love for all peoples. God, give me courage. God, give me sacrifice. Pray those things. Write this list down. Pray for it daily. Because Christ calls us to peacemaking, not gatekeeping. A couple decades ago, President Reagan asked Gorbachev to tear the wall down. It was a famous speech. They were standing outside the Berlin Wall, and of course we know the Berlin Wall came down. In between the two sections of the Berlin Wall, there was rubble from a church. That was the one thing that had been left standing when they erected the wall, and they found the rubble of the church. The thing about the church is it's not going away. The thing about the church is it's created by Father, Son, and Spirit. The thing about the church is God's Spirit dwells within us and wants us to be a witness to the world. The thing about the church is we are called to peace, making, not gatekeeping. So we gotta tear down the wall. Let's tear down the wall. Let's tear down the wall. We gotta do better. We gotta do better. Let it go.